Hey friends, welcome back to Studies and Counseling. We're having the most uh, asking, engaging questions about the field and having conversations and dialogue. We're really glad to be back. And today I'm particularly grateful to be with Dr. John Beebe. Um, how are you today, Dr. Beebe? I'm well, thank you. Yeah, I'm really, I've been looking forward to the conversation all day and for, for this week, actually. So excited to get in. And speaking of engagement, that's been a question we've been asking our guests at the beginning is just about this idea of uh, what has been kind of gripping you recently, engaging you, um, and what's been alive for you in whether it's in counseling or research or just in life in general. Well, probably the degree to which the uh, world is in the consulting room. I mean, it's as if people hurry to talk about their personal problems to get them off the plate so they can ask me their real question is what's happening to this world? And uh, that has become topic A for just about everybody. And there's hardly an hour in which that isn't referred to. And I talk, as it is possible to do now, to people in many parts of the world. And it's the same the world over. This isn't just our particular American tragedy, if we could call it that, our, our particular American crisis of shortfall between what we want to be as a country and what we actually are. And uh, uh, when I talk to people, whether they're in, in Baltic states or Asia, Northern Europe, it's the same. It's the same, the concern for where this world is going and the worry of it all and the question and beyond that of what does it even mean um, is becoming the, the background issue in every psyche and very much influences uh, not only conscious associations, which are partly media driven, of course, because we live in a world that has a certain amount of uh, news addiction, I suppose you could call it, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but, in, but also dreams, sometimes precognitive dreams, sometimes um, after the fact dreams, all referring to what's emerging what the prospects, not just for life as we always worry about it, but also what the prospect, as someone once used to title prospects for the soul, what are the prospects for the soul given that homelessness, for example, is becoming increasingly the living symbol of the world condition? Uh, mm. The question of what's really happening to the environment, what's happening to the weather, what's happening, but above all, what's happening to the way people um, protect, take care of, and relate to each other all, and in, in, a, in a political sense uh, that the ancient Greeks would have understood what's happening to the polis, what's happening to the city-state world. Uh, and uh, so it's kind of like, both another kind of responsibility, but another privilege to to be hearing how the psyche feels about all this. And the psyche, as voiced by my patients, at least, clients, people in therapy, supervision, training to be therapists, uh, couple work, individual work, are somewhere all reverberating what's emerging and wondering what it is so that I find myself saying to people well I think we're at the very hinge of history and I think we have to think realize that and the door is going to open in one way or another but with with this is the hinge is this, this everything hinges on this and what's happening now and 
it's nice to stay current with it. And sometimes when I say that, it's reassuring because I think some of the stories we hear about people of the past is that they kind of missed the moment sometimes, didn't catch when, and it's so nice doing this work at my age, which is almost 84, which will be in June, to just be there at my computer at, uh, looking to and talking to people around the world. I feel like I'm on, I don't want to say on the front lines because it's not necessarily only a battle, but just that I'm there, I'm present. I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm in my time. I feel that's one thing. And I'm in my time mainly because I've been listening to the psyche, which is usually a little bit ahead of its time and sort of names the subjects that are important. And they've all turned out to be important. Hmm. The ones that the psyche has named long before they were headlines. Uh, and that that happens again and again, uh, that a life spent li listening to one's own dreams and talking to people who are having dreams, talking to people's feelings and anxieties has opened up a being here now that I'm very happy about. And so it's not just about re re revisiting the past to recover trauma, but to realize that the present and even the future is a trauma too. And, and to be in the present is very vitalizing for me. So I feel very grateful for having this work. That's the simplest way to say it. Yeah, yeah. It's, so you've been kind of engaged by the moment um, and noticing in your clinical work that the, there's almost a, there, well, there is a dominant theme of trying to make sense of the world, the state of the world. And one of the dominant themes I was picking up, it was interesting to connect like homelessness uh, the, the the crisis we have with with housing and the environment, our home. Exactly. Yeah. Exists the ultimate issue. And the more we learn about our nearest neighbors, Mars and Venus, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, if if the, the the dinosaurs won't even come to Venus until the volcanic activity stops and. Uh, whoever was on Mars at one time from microbe to Minotaur has long since been buried in the dryness of the burned out planet. So there we are between these two neighbors that one hasn't enabled, hasn't cooled down enough and one has dried out. And mm -hmm. uh, what a gift we've had to have a planet that lets us do all the things we can do. What, what a, <laughs> a failure to, to appreciate the gift we, we are. I think that human story gets better and better all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm not grateful enough. But uh, to kind of let it be an Eden. <laughs> Mm. One thing you're talking about too is really striking me when it comes to like working working in the consulting room about being with the moment or not with uh, missing the moment. This is interesting because we might I could imagine wanting to maybe I could imagine I have a fantasy of uh, being in therapy myself and like someone saying, let's stay on, on let's talk about you, you know let's Let's talk about the relationship. Let's not talk about like the world. Like let's let's get focused. And I'm hearing like almost a different tack that you're taking is like, yeah, let's be focused on this crisis that we're. Let's not miss this um, and be be stuck somewhere else. So I was just intrigued by that as a way of working, um, but staying with the moment. Well, there's a very sad story about Jung and. What made Jung so interesting was that his psyche had so been on the case in the run up to World War I. He was active in 
developing the very basis of a depth psychotherapy that included the unconscious. He was still in his relationship with Sigmund Freud working on the psychoanalysis already beginning to qualify, limit, and, and disagree with Freud about things, which was not easy to do. So they were nearing the time when not only their personal relationship, but their professional relationship. I'm talking about the years between uh, 1912 and 1914. Uh, and it was in the fall of 1913 that he was on his way as people are in countries like Switzerland and France. The ritual often is going to your wife's mother's house uh, for a Sunday dinner, a very frequent ritual in that part of Europe, and he's on a train And suddenly he has this sort of vision of Europe covered by a lake of water tinged with blood. And so being a psychiatrist, he thought that this was a world catastrophe fantasy and that perhaps He was about to have the same kind of psychological catastrophe that he was used to treating in patients that he'd been working with at the Brook Holdsleeve not long before, um, that, dec that decade before with uh, Eugene Bloiler, who named schizophrenia and was the major psychiatrist of uh, Central Europe, created basically the kind of psychiatric education I was able to have. And there was Jung as his first assistant working with schizophrenic patients and making himself famous by having some capacity to reach them psychologically and with psychotherapy and counseling. And he knew as a psychiatrist that people who are going to have the schizophrenia often will start um, by having a fantasy of a world catastrophe. So Jung thought, oh my God, I, I, I'm, I'm going to have a psychosis and I don't know, know when that's going to uh, put a break, but uh, I'm going to have to do something about this. And something he did was to start his process of active imagination in which he went looking for the soul he felt he'd lost. Uh, in the course of developing his medical credentials and power. But what he meant by his soul was actually very specific. He had since late teenage years uh, kept a kind of spiritual diary of inner experiences and he would, he would record it. And it, there was a notebook that he was using and around the time he had graduated from medical school and begun the ascent that took him to study in Paris and to work with Bloiler and to do all the things that were going to make him famous, he had simply stopped writing in that notebook. So Jung kept track of things. He was in some ways a very orderly person. So every, every book in his library had, had an index card that he had made himself since adolescence. So it was very easy when, after he was gone for people to organize his library because they always they already had these index cards. They became the basis of all his bibliographies. And so he still had the same book and so 1902 is it stops being 
there stops being any entry. And then in 1913, there starts being an entry again, and he starts keeping track of his fantasies and, and his dreams and develops the technique of active imagination where you don't have to be asleep to have, you can have a kind of, not exactly dream, but you can have a, a visionary experience in which you actually engage with your own unconscious. And he went into that with the idea of looking for his soul and writing down these experiences, including that vision that he had and uh, certain dreams that came up. He discovered some very interesting things, one of which was that he wasn't actually crazy or going crazy, nor had he fully lost touch with his soul because he met her very early on. <clears throat> but when he has dreams, for instance, of a crown prince, Siegfried, uh, being assassinated by him, and that's in December of 1913, and then he has, uh, he's in lecturing, I think it's in Aberdeen, uh, Scotland, if I remember correctly, in uh, something like, uh, if memory serves, June 30th of uh, uh, 1914, Crown Prince, Ferdinand of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, a very cultural place from which Siegfried mythology would have come, this area, Germanic mythology. There's actually a German crown prince who was assassinated, and that is the beginning of uh, World War uh, World War One. And he said he was the only person in Europe who was happy because it meant to him that he wasn't psychotic but that what he'd been having was a kind of precognitive vision of some kind of, of an actual world catastrophe rather than just um, a subjective inner state of catastrophe for which there were ample reasons. He was having problems in his marriage. He was having problems at work. He was having a, the beginnings of a midlife crisis and he, he was having what nowadays would be diagnosed as an agitated depression. I, I, I do think there might have been something a bit bipolar about Jung, but I don't feel that there was ever, a, a, I don't think he, he doesn't have the feel to me of, 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 a, of, a, uh, of a schizophrenic man or a man who was, who, who was suffering from, although that was his fear and that is what some people will still say about Jung. So there is a man who, by staying in touch with himself and his visions and his feelings, even though their personal issues doesn't resist the temptation to reduce them all to the recapitulation of early object relations, but rather he's dealing with his participation, even if it's what he would call following Levi Brun, a participation mystique, a mystical, uh, participation, which is perhaps in part like projective identification of Melanie Klein, some kind of unconscious uh, buy-in to something going on in the world. Nevertheless, he took seriously the fact that this could be the engagement with the world. And in fact, the soul figure that he met early in his search for the soul, Salome, uh, uh, who was very extroverted sensation in type. She even says in the black books, we now have the record of the things he wrote in those books. She says, I'm all about sensation. She uses those words. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, what is sensation, but engaging, experiencing, and hopefully enjoying, she did at her, at her happiest was a belly dancer, but uh, the, uh, the enjoying the, the, the moment, being living in the moment. And she was saying to him that she was giving them, him, Jung, this intuitive man, gifts of magic and prophecy, among other things. And so she was trying to tell him, look, as <laughs> Hamlet says it in, in, in Shakespeare, oh, my prophetic soul. Well, there is such mm. a thing as a prophetic soul, and Jung had a prophetic soul, and he and this prophetic soul brought him into the world, 
and it and it it was very helpful to to him to realize that psyche is already on the case and although we think we're going crazy the sanity lies in being in the world in an anxious way when the world is when something's emerging be on be 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 ready for it it doesn't make doesn't seem to me to make uh, a far-fetched argument at all it would naturally be associated with survival and i'm sure from a darwinian standpoint if we have any kind of precognitive visionary capacity <clears throat> that would enhance survival because you kind of it gets you ready and so Anyway, he felt very grateful on, on that. Did I say June 30th? It's July 31st of July 31st. 1914, because the war, the, 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 date, the, the date they think of at the beginning of World War One is August 1st, but it was in the newspapers that the assassination had occurred and then the country started declaring war and the fat was in the fire. And there was a lake of blood over Europe, symbolically speaking. It really was the most devastating war yet. That's why they called it World War I. So that's why it's so disappointing that when Hitler came to power, Jung did not seem to grasp the seriousness of what was actually emerging. Now, I have to be fair. He did say that, it, that he knew 1940 would be a pivotal time. And he knew, he would have said that that was going to be the hinge of history. He was interested in astrology. There were astrological aspects that were there. He knew it at that level. But he kept talking about Hitler as if it was an inflation, a passive phenomenon, passing phenomenon, that it showed something about the archetypes and their power and how they come. And uh, he somehow felt that uh, this would be an example of an archetypal phenomenon that would probably carry with it the seeds of some kind of renewal and so that one shouldn't in a way get too excited about it they tried to reason about it and say things they tried to be, tried to be fair on both sides uh, he was conservative in his politics he wasn't fascist but he was not he was it was a certain there's a, there's a word that, uh, maybe it's a little unfair to you, but there's a word that the, the French use, bien passant, taking things, you just sort of say, this too will pass, kind of thing, mm -hmm. or this too. And, and so, <clears throat> so finally, when his, friend and follower who's in Israel, a wonderful Jungian analyst, Eric Neumann, writes to him great concern about Kristallnacht, that terrible night when Jewish businesses are all broken into by stormtroopers and the venom and the, the virulence that will not long four years later or so break out in the enactment of the final solution. But when it becomes perfectly clear exactly how ruthlessly Hitler's regime was going to treat the Jews, Neumann, a Jewish man, writes to him with concern about the events, and Jung writes back, you know, I, I've been so occupied with my work on the spiritual exercises of uh, St. Ignatius that um, I really haven't been paying too much attention to what's going on in the papers. Mm -hmm. Well, 
I don't want to minimize Jung's work on the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius either. Um, they were created, let me see if I say my church history correctly, by the founder, if, you, if I'm right, if I'm not looking up things, so who knows whether I'm right or not, but the founder of the um, Jesuit order, it was in fact St. Ignatius. <laughs> And he had taken as the basis of his exercises a statement from uh, the letters of John. Now, Jung really was <clears throat> a close reader of Christian texts, including the New Testament, but also the church fathers, and he had a phenomenal understanding of this, and he was particularly taken with the letters of John. Mm. There was an opinion that the John was one of the four um, writers of Gospels, um, Matthew, uh, Luke, and Mark being the others, uh, was the same person who wrote the letters of John and the same person who wrote the book of Revelation. These are all given to John. I think most biblical scholars think particularly the book of Revelation is by someone else, but Jung had this feeling that though they were all John at different stages of his development, so of course the gospel was the John who knew Jesus and was very much beloved by, by Jesus, the, uh, and so the one who starts with, in the beginning was the word, and the word was made flesh. Very important idea. Hmm. In the letters of John, and I'll leave the book of Revelation, the apocalypse, out of this, but just get the letters of John. If you look in John 1, I think it's uh, verse 4. John says, test the spirits if they be of God. Mm. And that was real important for Jung and so important that it became sort of the way he looked at complexes. He thought complexes were spirits and that spirits could take possession of one. And he said that when he and Freud met, Jung was already engaged in developing complex theory. He didn't, as some people think, invent the word complex, but he certainly did the most work on applying it uh, uh, to the treatment of very ill people. And he felt basically that psychoses are possessions by complexes. And that's still a useful idea. And then he also had experimental methods for studying them. Mm. Uh, and there had been a Berlin psychiatrist who actually named the term complex and had named Zian, and he had done some work with patients with it, but there was nothing compared to the degree to which Jung created the study of complexes. And so Jungian psychology, but in the 1930s, was now being called complex psychology. Mm. Uh, so, um, what, <clears throat> When Freud and Jung, so Freud was talking about unconscious conflicts, but there was Jung with his complex theory, and it was attracting psychiatrists. Freud wanted a psychiatrist to board. He, Freud was a neurologist. There weren't many psychiatrists at all in the psychoanalytic movement at first, and so he wanted somebody who could deliver psychiatry, and particularly American psychiatry, to uh, to psychoanalysis, and it worked. I mean, Jung, Jung was a great ambassador. So he and, and Freud talked a lot about complexes, and in his 1939, uh, uh, in memory of Sing Sigmund Freud, written just a few weeks after, and published a few weeks after Freud, uh, Freud had died, um, uh, Jung says that what he couldn't get across 
to Freud was that when a complex possesses us, it's not just some unconscious conflict from the past taking over from which we have to be delivered because, but it has a spirit and test the spirits if they be of God, that is to say, the possessing complex may have a purpose, have a reason, have mm. a goal in taking possession of us so that we will realize some value that has been ignored and he said it was in vain. He couldn't, or it couldn't take that aboard. And what actually, from a Freudian point of view, that's mysticism, the, the idea that there's a purposiveness to neurosis. Mm. No, they're neurotic because we don't want to face certain things. And if you face them, uh, it's not pleasant, but it's better than being, being in the grip of a hysteria or an obsession or some kind of other. Uh, so, so, Freud understood the possession, but he didn't understand the purpose of the possession. And, and Jung never said that all the complexes would be of God, but they might be. There might be a purpose in it. And his own experience with being possessed by this image of the lake of blood was an example of a complex occupying his attention and crowding out just about everything else to the point that he wondered, Am I going crazy or what? And then it turns out, no, I'm not exactly going crazy. I'm becoming aware of an emergent phenomenon, which is that the world is going to have a crazy period here. So there was Jung with that wonderful record. But then when the Second World War is coming, he's got the astrology of it. He's even working, in a sense, on the question of when possessions occur, is there any meaning? Um, and I think there was some meaning in World War II. There was a wake up call. And I do think things have happened since that have been good for human consciousness. But at the same time, you don't get the same sense as World War II is coming. He's so touch up too busy laying the groundwork for his own theory and talking about analytical psychology and moving back into a power position in terms of defining his position versus other psychological thinkers, mm -hmm. that at least at the feeling level, how could anybody write a letter saying, you know, I've been so busy with the spiritual exercises of uh, St. Ignatius that I couldn't pay attention to Kristallnacht. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a classic to me of missing the moment in a sense, even though at another level, of course, he's on the case and we could still find, and it's like Eric Neumann dropped him with despair then. No, Eric Neumann went on trying to create a basis for a better analytical psychology. But at that moment, I feel bad that Jung wasn't more, you can't have everything and everyone, and I'm in type, type gets into this. Jung was an introverted intuitive. He was working at the religious level. I'm an extroverted intuitive. I tend to work in the, but I, I, just, I just feel that I think most people would say that it, as, my friend Jerry Jerome Bernstein recently passed away uh, said about Jung in the 30s with regard to the to what was going on to the Jew, with, with Jews his 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 silence on the subject of the signs of tremendous suffering emerging his silence was deafening and of course this gets played out that Jung was anti-Semitic or Jung was pro-Nazi. None of that in my, in the, at least in the usual sense of anti-Semitism, but I wouldn't say that. And I know for a fact his enormous kindness to Jewish people uh, that he, like his own secretary, Anel Yaffe, who he chose to write his autobiography. In effect, she is as told to her and 
I met and talked with her. She said he chose a Jewish woman to write his autobiography. This is not anti-Semitic. But uh, at the same time, and he was very kind to her and did all kinds of wonderful things uh, to make it easy for her to, she was going to be a psychiatrist in Germany, had to leave. He, and she, he, he, did, he did things for her. He sent her once on a vacation so she could get with his money to, so she could have something. And, and he, she's talked about that with gratitude. Uh, she, he, he, it wasn't that he didn't, wasn't personally kind or blind, but you get the feeling that this time he didn't get it till too late. Mm -hmm. Whereas before he was there. So what's the difference? And the difference is that like Freud, like everybody, probably like me, for, you know, me like all of them, that my little piece of it in terms of adding to typology. If your biggest issue is getting your theory in people's minds, um, you get possessed by your local ambition and you're no longer on the front lines paying attention to what's emerging for which precisely our present theories couldn't possibly be complete. That's the whole point of being, paying attention to the emergent is that that's where theory should come from is making room for what's emerging. But when you're trying to keep treating history like a horse and you're trying to tame it so that it will, and you can ride on it with your theory, then you've sort of lost that thing that Jung had when he was younger and didn't know so much. So let me call this in praise of not knowing everything <laughs> and not getting too caught up in your theory because I think even Jung, but the best part is that I think he realized this and he, uh, he uh, now here's a piece I can tell you that might interest you. Correct. I was able to publish a paper um, not long ago um, that I'm rather happy about. Um, it came out of the proceedings of a conference in Prague. Um, that was given by the International Association for Analytical Psychology. And I had an interesting document uh, that had been sent to me by uh, uh, Vicki Jo Varner, who is a woman uh, I met through my work on uh, typology, she was present in a number of my uh, lectures talking about my own additions and extensions of Jung's idea of the eight, what we nowadays call function attitudes, with, with the original psychological types being not types of people, but types of consciousness. So uh, he names these as function types, and they're the famous thinking, feeling, sensation, intuition in their extroverted and introverted aspects, which gives you eight, what nowadays we call function attitudes. He would have called them function types of consciousness, not types of people, but types of consciousness. We call them the brilliant particles out of which consciousness is made, the eight mm. species of consciousness. And I've been very interested in that. Vicky Joe was very interested in what I had to offer, and she's herself a you know, got her PhD and, and is a remarkable uh, person about typology. And she sent me uh, a talk that Tony Wolf had given in 1934 on a trip to uh, England. And she gave it in English, and I was able to get permission from the uh, Analytical Psychology Club 
in London to uh, uh, quote from this essay that, that, that this talk that she gave in which she talks about a dream about the coming of, of uh, the, the events in Germany at that time, which would be, of course, the coming to power of Hitler. Now that took place in uh, 1933, and she's lecturing in 1934, and she's talking about a man who was uh, uh, <clears throat> about 60 years old, who had a particularly strong interest in um, Uh, history and uh, who is particularly uh, uh, interested in uh, Julius Caesar and uh, yeah. so that um, this man <clears throat> she talked about a couple of dreams that the man had in 1933 and 1934 and um, the second in 1934 actually had a production of Julius Caesar in uh, contemporary uh, uh, times and a certain feeling the man had about that production. But the dream in 1933 was the one that I particularly focused upon because she talked about it and she talked about the man had a dream that um, somehow, and I'm not looking at the dream right now, so I'll just say what I can remember. The, the dream involved basically the coming to life of a mummy, uh, an Egyptian mummy. And there, it was like this thing from the past the body of a pharaoh um, um, was somehow coming to life in the present moment. And the uh, dreamer is terribly, terribly um, uh, upset about this. It's, it seemed it, 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 it's, it's, it's the 60-ish year old dream is just terribly upset by this. And uh, the later dream in 34 has something to do with uh, Julius Caesar and he's kind of resisting the idea that Julius Caesar is any kind of answer. So I would prefer the reader to the to the actual texts of my my my, my paper for the actual dream. So I'm not trying to talk so much about the actual texts in great precision in this interview. But to tell you what Tony Wolf said she had said to the dreamer, in which she said to the dreamer, well. Who was the man of the hour that stepped forward to save uh, 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 Rome uh, when there was chaos and the Republic wasn't working and there was uh, the need for a strong leader and then he assumed the powers. He was a conscious man and a cultured man and a writer of history and a knowledge of history and this man was able to come in at this time so you don't need to be so worried about the re-emergence of a pharaonic principle um, or the replay of some of the events because there is Julius Caesar and he will seize the power now what a wildly interesting reductive analytic interpretation that is because of course 
what happened is that after the assassination of Caesar, who had had his chief, who had tried to stay not only the consul of Rome, but appropriated dictatorial powers to save the Republic, ironically, after his uh, uh, assassination, parliamentary democracy disappeared for Europe, from Europe for 1,700 years. It wasn't until 1,700 years later that there was any parliament in Europe that was powerful enough. In other words, that centralization of power. Moreover, the obvious feelings of the person in the dream of 1933 was that this reawakening of the of the mummy, the pharaoh, the pharaoh with the absolute power, was an art was it was a horror. It was an archaic thing coming to life that was a horror. So in the typical way of the analytical psychology, the affect is 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 given short shrift as the dreamer. Mm -hmm. Instead, the image of the archetype is said, and you have nothing to worry about. Since I believe that the 60-year-old man whose dream she was talking about was C.G. Jung, because Jung was fascinated with history, and Jung kept a bust of, of uh, Julius Caesar in his consulting room, I believe that Jung had these dreams, told them to Tony Wolfe, and got that interpretation from her. Now, that's what happens when you use your... Uh, uh, second wife with whom you're having an affair uh, uh, as, as your analyst. I think it's a terrible analytic interpretation. But I also think that that explains in a human way that Jung's psyche was on the case. But the theory of complexes and complex psychology, now, fortunately, Jung was moving away from the influence of Tony Wolf, who was embodying his own, she was present at the creation of his own great theory of, of, of complexes that became analytical psychology and complex psychology. But he was beginning to get interested in alchemy and uh, interested in things that were more, and and Tony Wolf couldn't follow that. And uh, so Marie uh, Louise Frost says that's where she made her mistake because at that, it, it was, he, because she couldn't, participate with the same zeal she had participated in the theory of types and she may even have written the definitions in the in the book psychological types and she was there as he was developing complex psychology but you see when when a theory starts taking over and you don't listen to your sensitivity to the emergent then i think the irony is that the young Jung, who didn't know anything, was not was more able to be present than the older Jung, who knew too much and had somebody reassuring him with an interpretation. And he sort of acted out that interpretation when he talked on Berlin radio in 1933, when he was talking about basically that it. Hitler was the Fuhrer principle. Well, the Fuhrer principle is both the Pharaoh principle and the Caesar principle and so forth. And that this would, this would, and that the Fuhrer needed to know himself better, but that he didn't think that it would, it wouldn't, it was a sense of not something that wouldn't come to too much. And he was talking about the time of the parliament is over. It's probably his most embarrassing performance. It, it, it isn't a, it isn't, it, he's, what he's talking about, but that it has this, as I call it before, bien passant, taking it in passing, and this reassurance, which I think, had he really been listening to the psyche, the psyche was that he didn't want the reenactment of, of, uh, of uh, the Julius Caesar story. He didn't want the emergence of the pharaonic principle, and he was at first horrified by it, and he should have been. That was the that was what Jung could have been listening to if he'd had. So when I'm working with people today, I try not to let even my own great ideas uh, go to my head. Uh, I try very hard as if I'm a beginner, the beginner's mind is listening to what's emerging and what is upsetting them and not 
telling them that they shouldn't be upset by that. I'm trying to see how what they're upset about is really worth being upset about. And that, and I keep seeing again and again how the psyche is on the case of whether or not the psychotherapist is on the case depends on whether they're really listening to the psyche. And even Jung and Tony Wolf, and there are many evidences that Tony Wolf was a great psychotherapist. I don't want to just make this a beat up Tony Wolf. And but these people were all limited by what we've put together blinding us to what's emerging. So you see, that's mm. where we have to stay at the beginning. <laughs> Every time we're always just beginning. I hope that gets it clear about what I, I think there is the attitude that I'd like to convey to people. I, and when I talk about with, where they missed things, I'm also talking to myself about when I miss things by, by not listening not only to the images, but to the affective effect of the images that we so, are so blessed to have in dreams. We, we, do we, so we don't only really see archetypes. We see in dreams almost how we really feel about it or how could they, they could be felt. And the feelings in dreams are very, very important sometimes to, to enable us to know how to relate to them so that we don't make the mistake of... Um, so blinded by the archetype that we don't see the call to consciousness in relation to it that's coming up at the same time. I've had many such dreams and, they, and listening to my feelings in the dreams have really helped me uh, find something I wouldn't have found in just my conscious mind because it's if the unconscious knows what to worry about and what not to worry about and, and I don't have that ability when I'm awake. So that might help you to understand how this young in view can be used and misused. Mm. And that, so that's why where I bring up these, uh, I think, historical mistakes. Now, do I know for sure that Young was the 60-year-old man? Of course not. But I think it's a good bet. And I and I certainly think that even if he wasn't, somebody's alarm was being falsely reassured by somebody's young in interpretation at the time. Yeah, very fascinating anecdotes, like bringing us through history from World War One to World War Two, and then with the emphasis on like one where it kind of went right, or or Jung was able to stay with the moment and be present with it, and one where it was a bit more difficult, um, and bringing that into like the, the the present day. I mean, another thing I was struck by, Doctor BB, you were talking about this very interesting idea about testing the spirits. If they and, be a <laughs> yeah, and this idea of being possessed, and it was striking me very, how I conceptualize art a lot, like an idea just needs to be expressed or feels like it needs to be expressed. And maybe that's something to really explore. Um, but with this idea of like being with the moment, kind of what I feel so I think of a number of crises, and I wonder if they connect. I think of shootings that are going on in the United States. I think of um, this thing that some of the sociologists are calling it the diseases of despair, which is just suicide, alcohol, heroin overdose, how this is just skyrocketing. And then I think of um, these images in January 6th of the Capitol burning, um, these very powerful images. And then when I really confront these things, I have this intellectual idea of, wow, this is really horrible. But I do feel like a bit of a numbness or a flatness. Um, and that disturbs me. Um, I feel disturbed by the lack of, and even with the COVID, the amount of deaths, um, kind of connecting with people when we're talking about this. I mean, the, the flatness, it, it's almost the guiding affect is like the, I guess it's maybe a disassociation in some sense, maybe. Um, and I, I do believe this is an obstacle for me to stay with the moment, both in the room and also just on an individual level. Well, let's first of all, this is your doing that I've been flashing on just since 
you know, as a working psychotherapist at any given moment in time, that will be someone that I may be working with who is struggling with despair. I mean, really struggling with it. And, uh, testing the spirits, finding out that they're not of God and don't seem to be of God and can't imagine another solution. And ending it all. Um, and so, 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 after World War II and after he saw what he hadn't taken seriously enough and began to really do so in a different way, with a different spirit, he writes some wonderful things. And Ion, he talks about how it's a rare and shattering experience to look in the face of human evil. Mm -hmm. Or he said, doesn't say human evil, he calls it absolute evil. And I want to get that term correctly. The problem of evil is really hard to deal with. Because not all the spirits are of God, and sometimes one is looking at actual evil, and there's no getting around it. And so we might meet this when we're very young uh, in certain aspects of our families, aspects that go under the rubric of sadism and the kind of ruthlessness that's involved in various forms of child abuse. Um, so the rare and shattering experience is the experience for some people early, early in life, and it can haunt them their entire life, as we all know. Um, there's a lot of gratuitous evil in this country right now. Um, and I had a very intuitive man that I saw at a particular time around the year 2000. He was basically articulating for me something that I was feeling that many other people have felt and perhaps concretized in what I would call the wrong way, but that feeling that Satan was stalking the earth. One could actually have images of something shadowy on, uh, and, and people did have such images. Now, kind of coalesced with, with the World Trade Center bombing, and then many, many people putting evil act actually. And, uh, a lot of people respond. People respond in different ways, and of course, uh, we're all aware of. How people with a sense of evil will often do evil in the name of conquering evil. And that's an obvious mm. problem. I suspect that even some of the people who are shooting people imagine that they're also killing evil when they do so. I mean, I, I don't know that that's been stated as such, but we, of course, see the evil in what they're doing. But, you know, it's very hard to have a sense of evil respond to it without yourself becoming an evildoer. I mean, that's just a, that's just a, it's, that's part of the contagion for, for evolution, the autonomy of evil, a figure, a figure like Satan it makes sense. So I feel like, um, I think it, I think we need to have compassion for how many people despair of being up to the problem dealing with so much evil at one time. Especially if you have doubts about yourself and don't even think yourself is a very good person. Or even if you do think you're a good person, you may not you may feel that you're too weak to deal with it. So I have a lot of sympathy for people who feel despair. And is that spirit of despair, is there any way in which that is a complex which could be of God? Well, in one sense, I don't actually 
I think despair helps people in and of itself, but it's a step toward appropriate self-doubt because we should doubt our ability to handle evil well. Uh, and then maybe we'll find the strength to handle it better. And I would say that every psychotherapist is called upon to deal with something evil, either that's been done to the person or being perpetrated by the part of the person that identified with some earlier evil. And I think that we have to help people in facing their own shadow, not perpetuate something that's already wounded them. I, I feel that um, we should doubt our ability to do this. And perhaps if we doubt it enough, we will be inspired to do the little we can. And that little we can can mean a lot. And so I feel that I want to turn despair into doubt, and I want to turn doubt into conscience, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. and, I, and that would be what I would call integrity and depth in the process, because I think, I think of anxiety and depression both as symptoms of integrity. It's integrity, that, a recognition that our present attitude is not adequate. Sometimes when I'm there, I'm a much better therapist than when I'm on top of the case. And, think that I know and therapy knows what should be said. I, we have to remember we're a very young field. Mm. So I think the counseling, but you know, listening to the unconscious can be kind of a wonderful thing. Uh, I, I want to tell you a happy story because we're okay. getting awfully black and dark. And right. also in my own time, I happened to be there the, the, uh, when Nancy Pelosi was running for uh, Congress for the first time. <laughs> and I, there was there was a neighborhood uh, meeting on 19th Street in San Francisco in a private home. And there are a circle of maybe 25 Democrats or 20 Democrats met this woman who was running for Congress for the first time. And it was Nancy Pelosi. And she was very unpretentious, very nice, and, and talked about herself a little bit. So I was favorably in, in, interested in her. And then she did win. And then later, um, that would have been probably, I can't remember, but it was in, <clears throat> I'm guessing, just this is just guessing, but I think it was around 1987 or 88 that I was that I that I saw her. And then we had a private Jungian gathering uh, in Sausalito about politics and psyche. And Andrew Samuels, whose book, The Political Psyche, had been published in 1993, and I'd taken in some of the things I've been talking about, the political awareness of psyche, became a theme in his book, which I had a chance to give him some uh, editorial advice about it. It's a very great reading experience. Uh, mm. It was on jury duty and I was <laughs> uh, uh, had hours to to go over Andrew's manuscript and in jury duty I was reading and through Andrew's the political psyche and, ma and manuscript was a wonderful experience. Anyway, he was there. Clarissa Pinkola Estes was there. Um, uh, Bill Bradley was there because he was friendly with one of the men, Thomas Singer, who worked on the theory of cultural complexes that Samuel Kimball's, Kimball's in our institute and Tom Singer worked together uh, on their book on um, cultural complexes. But Tom this year had published a book, had edited papers called The, uh, the Vision Thing. And so it was all about the politics. And, that was very much in the air. And we had this conference and uh, talking about psyche and politics and interesting people there. Uh, the novelist Isabella Allende, uh, who was the uh, niece of the Allende who was assassinated in, in Chile, she, she was there. Mm -hmm. uh, not talking, but present in the audience. It was really quite an event. And Nancy Pelosi showed up. 
have to pay, pay a visit. And she said something rather marvelous to us. She said that uh, she'd heard there was this conference of young ins and she wanted to come. She was there with her um, handsome assistant. And, and, and it was it was really quite quite a quite a, a, a nice thing. And she had a lot more elegance and persona than when she just uh, was running. But uh, she said that <clears throat> She came from a Catholic family in Maryland, and that it, they were a political family, and that meant that the men ran for office and the women passed out leaflets. And she went to a Catholic university, but in her, I think it was her senior year, uh, a book was assigned, and it was Jung's Answer to Job, in which. Um, He underlines something that in 1950, Pope Pius uh, was 12th, had um, made a dogma, which was the doctrine of the assumption that Mary was actually in heaven, received in heaven, taken up into heaven, and therefore. Jung had underlined this in answer to Job. I, I, I knew this because I had read a bit of it and I hadn't read all of it at that time. He had said that this was the most important event in church history um, in 2000 years. Somehow when I read that as a very young young man, I had read this and, and I knew the date of the book was 1950. And I, somehow I read that sentence as this is the most important event in history in the last 2000 years. <laughs> And and I said to and I remember my e e ego reaction. You could say I, I just said, "Give me a break." You know, 1950 was when the hydrogen bomb uh, was uh, a reality, and uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the doctrine of the assumption of Mary becomes a dogma in the Catholic Church. So what? Well, Nancy Pelosi didn't respond to it that way. She said that when she read that, she read that book and she said, you know, if Mary can go to heaven, I can run for Congress. Wow. Oh. Think of that. So now we can go back to my earlier criticism, Jung and, you know, saying, you say, Jung is, I'm so busy with the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. Well, I mean, you can only and Jung pay attention to crystal nut. Well, God, yes, I'm right about that to some degree. But am I right when I say Jung is off in La La Land when he's talking about the Virgin Mary at the same year we have the hydrogen bomb? Not so. Jung recognized that by putting Mary in heaven, the feminine principle is suddenly there. Feminism would turn out to be the single most important intellectual movement of the 20th century. No one would have imagined that in 1950, and it wouldn't imagine it would have the practical effect of Nancy Pelosi, who, by common consent among people who believe as I do, is the best speaker of the House we've ever had, and single and many times single-handedly saved this country from a fascist takeover. I mean, amazing work was done by that woman being in office when she was. She was one of those angels that has always appeared in American history to save this republic. Now that is a, that is a very, that's a Northern California Democrats view and I'm sure people will be appalled who are on the other side, but everyone would admit that she was some kind of presence and that she stood for democracy. And there's Xi Jinping on the case. So that who's to say that Jung, and of course, this is the Jung after World War II and after he's corrected the degree to which he didn't anticipate the, the ferocity of what was going to come. So Jung is not just another pretty face. And again, his ability to summon in his writings, 
issues and images that haunt us as we read him, look at the practical effect of that giving that now, of course, she's a politician and she was saying that to us and it may have not been the only reason she made the decision. It was certainly a charming speech she made to us, but I think there's a home truth in it. That uh, young and listening to the psyche is essential, is very practical. And she, hearing Jung listen to the psyche, seeing this event as an event for soul, gave her spirit the spirit was of God. It got her. It got her there. Got her there. Got her to feel that she could do something more than pass out leaflets. Wow. Yeah, it's it's so interesting to, and also very apropos of your work on uh, personality and how you know regulating systems and and balance to see uh, these different perspectives and how it can be introverted religious perspective can be essential at one point and then it. Can, but it, it can also be limiting and, and we can, we can miss, miss things and vice, vice versa. Speaking of that, there's this, I wanted to ask you, Dr. Beebe, of, about development. You brought up um, the idea of some of your ideas around integrity. We've been talking about this on the show. We've been trying to look at development. There's a couple aspects, and I, I'm asking people to reflect on their development and ideas about development over time. I'm also asking people about their influences and people who made an impact on them um, in a personal fam family or also intellectual course and career. I'm curious what kind of constellates for you around this question of development. Well, there were a series of people. Um, <clears throat> I was lucky enough to have a mother to start with who uh, really read a great deal. She a really sad story. She had a social phobia and she was a very bright, intuitive you know, woman, but she was maybe too intuitive for her time and she had a troubled uh, early developmental history, but she was in school, in, in, in high school, and she dropped out of high school too because she gave a presentation on allergies. My mother was born in 1918. She made, gave this presentation in 1933. And um, as she was pre presenting this talk on allergies, the kids started giggling and the teacher said, well, it sounds like a witch's brew to me. This is a Southern public school. And it was so humiliating to my mother that she dropped out of school. She didn't tell her mother. Um, her mother was married to a traveling auditor. And so they would be indifferent of the Rural, rural Electrification Association, which was a Franklin Roosevelt um, innovation. And so it was reasonably easy to, they, every school would be a new school and this kind of thing. And, so she would, she would instead go to the public library every day and read. And uh, she was incredibly well read. She read Proust and Joyce and Mann and, and so many things, Arson McCullers. And, and I was very fortunate to, uh, she loved movies. And so she was very psychologically minded. She did have uh, some therapy. Um, uh, but we had very little money. She was able to trade doing some secretarial work for doing therapy. And so she um, did have, she could say things like psychoanalysis is my religion. So I had the first influence was my mother's interest in dreams. She loved to write to dreams. She interested in movies, interested in me. <laughs> hmm. so I certainly got a lot out of having an introverted, intuitive mother to kind of pay attention to, to psychological things when I was young. Then when I went to college, I had a friend who was, who, again, through the feminine side, my father was a military man. My parents divorced when I was young, and so I didn't have a lot of contact with him. So I'd often meet things through the feminine side, but there was a mother of a friend of mine named Nancy Hale, 
was her name. And she was, she held the world's record for the most number of stories sold to the New Yorker in a single year. And that was 12 back in the wow. 1940s. She was frequently published. Um, and she had had a Jungian analysis and she talked about it a great deal. And she's the person I first talked to about my own wish to do psychological work. I was, I started as a volunteer in a mental hospital and that was so exciting to me that I did with the children's, working with autistic children that I got interested in being a psychotherapist. And I went to medical school. When I was in medical school, the big influence on me, I uh, <clears throat> was uh, time I spent <clears throat> with a psychologist who was actually a philosopher who's rather famous now, Eugene Gendlin, who created the uh, focusing technique. Mm. He was sort of my mentor for a time. I was working as a research assistant with him, and my name was on the first uh, published article on the focusing manual, uh, and because I'd done some research of applying the manual in schools, so we had long and endless conversations about uh, <clears throat> psychology and his book, Experiencing and the Creation of Meaning, and his emphasis on felt experience was so helpful. So it gave me a way when I got into therapy myself, I was interested in Carl Rogers and I wanted to have a Rogerian. The man I asked was a Jungian psychiatrist, but I didn't, who I just was a man working at the same hospital that I was doing my internship in. And he was in Jungian training. I wasn't that interested in being a Jungian, even though Nancy Hale had been in Jungian analysis and talked about it. And I had a friendly feeling about Jung in that sense. But it was really Rogers I wanted, it. but my friend said, that, well, he, that he couldn't find a Rogerian in San Francisco, but there was a, a, a man, and Carl Rogers would stay at his house when he visited uh, San Francisco, and he was a Jungian. Would that be good enough? And that was my first Jungian analyst. <laughs> so in the course of working with him, his name was John Perry, and uh, he, he, uh, he was a very, very good dreams and he did he did a world of good as I described the affects I was having which I described as a depression he said well do you ever dream when you're depressed and that question opened up my life because I've always dreamed that no one had ever accorded it that kind of value and suddenly I think my mother had but that there was something incestuous about that here I was really they were my dreams and somehow so, so then I found myself able to talk about my dreams and the rest was history. Sadly, it would be my fate to have to confront John Perry because he was one of the many people who was wonderful if you were a male therapist and I was a doctor and he was a doctor and there was a kind of patriarchal transmission. But sadly, he was one who, when working with women, patients became the and I think rather crazily involved with what he thought was healing behavior when it was sexual behavior. And uh, eventually there was a great struggle and one that was a personal making of my life was to, no matter how much helped I was by this man, I was very helped. I had to stand up to him and actually encourage someone he'd abused to report, to really report it. And, they did, and uh, and he was indefinitely suspended, and then eventually, uh, finally, uh, fully resigned from the institute. It was a, in retrospect, it may sound, it took it took longer than it should have. It was too little and too late in one way. In another way, it was the necessary thing both for my growth and the growth of my whole group of people, and I was not the only one to kind of come to terms with. This is dangerous, sensitive work, and we have to treat it with great respect, no matter how good we are and how smart we are and how sensitive we are. Um, our love is not the human power, nor is the beauty, the beauty we encounter when people's psyches are waking up 
ours to savor and delight in in, in, a, in, a, in an ancestral seducive way. And so those were the mentoring experiences that I had from uh, women, my mother, Nancy Hale, men, Eugene Jindal and John Perry. Later, I got to be working with, uh, with a woman analyst, Elizabeth Osterman, a remarkable person, thought a great deal about spirit and uh, then finally um, and humility and uh, then Joseph Henderson, who I really, really enjoyed working with for almost a quarter of a century and was in that sense such a great role model to me, both about always say what you know and always say what you don't know and be, and be present. And that was really quite helpful and he was very, very good was for me, and I think he really helped me and, and really cured me of some things that you wouldn't expect to be cured of, and also taught me by example that there's never a cure for being yourself, and that's mm. all you have. So those are my mentors, and those are my my role models. Yeah, it's such a beautiful uh, just final summation of that of. of not trying to cure the self of and this idea we've been talking about uh from the beginning about testing the spirits because they might be of god it's just that's been a real theme for me in, in this conversation and i want to thank you dr bb you've been extremely generous with your time Chad, and it's been uh amazing to talk talk with you um i think in the spirit of how we started we tried to stay with the moment um what we didn't get to cover was the absolute incredible work you've done and are doing um, on personality. And I'm curious if people are attracted to you and your ideas and your way of working, where do we go? Where do we go to learn more about the work of uh, Dr. Beebe? Two places. Start with my book, Integrity and Death, because that's the point of the whole thing is in a sense to awaken yourself to the potential we all have to live up to ourselves, let's put it that way, and then get to the book on psychological types, energies and patterns in psychological types, and psychological type, actually, and energies and patterns in psychological type, colon, <laughs> the reservoir of consciousness. And I think that last the subtitle often does contain the real meat, or in this case, the real river. It's the reservoir of consciousness. It's the fact that we have in us this ca ca capacity for consciousness, these eight brilliant particles that you named, and that they arrange, us, they arrange themselves in us in different ways, and we can call those the type profiles of which the famous Myers-Briggs type indicator it has developed 16 profiles of personality based on what one's dominant type and one's auxiliary type is. My book tells us what dominant and auxiliary mean and what the other six mean because and where it, and what it means to have access to all of them and how each is carried by a different archetypal field and of course it's the type it's important, but there's also the archetypal field carrying the type. Uh, and uh, so when you're looking at me and listen to me, you've listened to a dominant, extroverted, intuitive, um, who's always been thrilled by the emergent and open to it and enjoys envisioning and uh, particularly enjoys entertaining new things and envisioning them and then finally what they're going to come to and then finally enabling that to happen when it seems propitious. So that's my being, that's easy to see. And you've also listened to the way I try in a more rational way using introverted thinking, my auxiliary function to kind of define things and name things and 
point out telling examples and so that I'm really <clears throat> trying to name and define and hopefully understand. And so each of the types has its own story arc and its persona, which you may not get until you can accept it, but it is your persona and then it has your ego, what you intend, and then yourself, which is also how you join all the other selves in the world and adding to the sum of value, just as Nancy Pelosi added to the sum of value by running for Congress. So she somehow got to the point where she could actually not just pass out leaflets, but be part of the story. And uh, so I feel like uh, each of the uh, eight types of consciousness is a window on the world um, that there are eight of them makes me think of something, I'll, an image I'll leave you with. Typology in sort of to the tw 21st century and the 20th century, uh, particularly late 20th and early 21st century, what in the uh, <clears throat> 19th century phrenology was. And uh, there is a the great phrenologist was a man named Orson Fowler. This was a huge where you found the various bumps on the head and from the basis of them figured out what was going on in the brain underneath. A typology is a little like that. And Orson, but it was very popular in the 19th century. And Orson Fowler, um, who uh, was the leading phrenologist in America, was also a very serious amateur architect, and he designed a kind of house that people were fond of building in the 1850s in America. They were all over America. It's called the Octagon House, and the house is in the shape of an octagon, and, and you can go to every room and get a different window view, and he has all these wonderful uh, images uh, of this. Is all done, this is all in the 19th century. Doesn't it? it looks almost like Jung's diagrams of the self, doesn't it? His, his ground plan for for the house. And the houses themselves were quite interesting and beautiful. And there's one in San Francisco uh, down near Union Street that people visit and so forth. So I like to think of uh, what I've been building is, um, there was a BB named William BB in the 1920s, he, no, no direct relative, but he invented something called the bathysphere, which is you would go, be, you would go down into the uh, uh, ocean and you could look out through the various windows at uh, all the things that were slithering by <laughs> in the ocean. Well, in the same sense, uh, my, my my way of using the eight function model is it's a model of a kind of a little s self that uh, is a little bit like a bathysphere that you can, except it has, not, I think his had six, I think mine has eight, it has Jung's eight function attitudes, and they represent the ability to see things whole and then the round from a different series of perspectives. And for me, that's the joy of it all, is that you don't have to be limited by your own particular outlook or what an MBTI test might indicate might be your type. It's not ethical to do it on the basis of the test alone unless you've had an interview going over what the test and the test results mean with an actual person to see if it even fits you. But the key is the idea that any consciousness is one of many. And so if you can get all of them, then you really can have something like a worldview. And that I would think would be a mature political perspective too, in which you really make room in a psychological democracy for more than one point of view. And you also find that you have that democracy inside yourself. So it makes it easier to accept the democracy and believe in it if you already have found it in yourself, that no one perspective has every, has every takes in everything. But if you have a, a access to all of them, something in you consciousness will then emerge, not the, the individual consciousness, uh, the, but something more magical. There's a sum of it all, which is an emergent consciousness. And that's what we dream of when we do therapy in a dialogic way. And when we have political life where people actually debate positions 
with mutual respect. Uh, that's that's the that's what I, my work is about, and if my book is a contribution in that regard. Oh, thank you, Dr. Beebe. So we'll start with your book on integrity, and then dig into this fascinating, beautiful image of the octagon, and also <laughs> being underwater. Um, Again, yeah, kind of bringing me back to this idea of pluralism as yeah. kind of meta value, and especially, I didn't reflect on it, but um, when you mentioned the loss of parliamentary democracy for so long and hundred years, yeah, yeah, and the um, flexibility of uh, of a pluralistic system. Yeah, having this image of the octagon and connecting that with personality is kind of helping me make the bridge between the introverted and extroverted world a little bit um, right now. So I'm grateful for this image. And we'll see if we can get some counselors together to do a reading group on your book on integrity. I'll put that intention out publicly. So people let me know if you're interested in doing that. And uh, I just want to say I want to respect your time, Dr. Beebe. So I want to say thanks so much for, for being here. And we'll see everyone in the next one. All right. Bye. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Okay.